charge here is to talk about the causes of the Civil War. And in one sense, that's really simple. It's about slavery. And when you talk about the road to the Civil War, the, the indispensable topic, question, issue, matter, debate is all about slavery. And you know, I think we've come around as a society to what Abraham Lincoln said in his second inaugural, which is that everyone knew that it was somehow about slavery. Um, but the question is how? And I think that's the challenge that we have in bringing this to our classroom, whether it's eighth grade um, US history students, or in, in my case, you know, students in the US history survey about understanding how it was that slavery was so integral to the road to the Civil War, because saying it's about slavery, it sounds simple, but it's not. Slavery is interwoven into every aspect of American society in the 19th century. So you're not just talking about an economic system. You're talking also about a political system. You're talking about a social system. And it's really infused into every aspect of, of the 1800 to 1860 era that leads to this horrific war. So when we talk about the road to the Civil War, I use this question with my own students, which is how, and I emphasize that first word, how did controversies over slavery become so sectionalized between North and South? How did they become so vicious that we end up fighting each other and killing each other starting in 1861, right? It's not just that slavery is a controversy, it's that slavery becomes the controversy and becomes something so sectionalized and such a vicious fight. That's, that's the question, how does that happen, right? And it's important to focus on because as you guys know, with the, the revisions of the TEKS that the state of Texas made fairly recently, you know, your, your readiness standard 8.8B has to do exactly this, right? Explain the central role of expansion of slavery in causing sectionalism, causing disagreements over states' rights and the civil war. The key word here is explain, right? How do we unpack that for our students and, and, and really try to understand the way that that lays out? That's what I wanna do in this presentation. And so that's where I'm gonna aim uh, in the half hour that I've got to kind of go through some of this stuff. So I'm gonna go a little fast and furious at times, but again, along the way, throw, throw questions into the chat box and we'll circle back around and try to address anything and everything you guys have on your minds, okay? So for me, the way I unpack this with my students is to talk about the First and foremost, the Cotton Revolution that erupts in the 18 teens, specifically 1815, and really changes the trajectory of slavery in the United States. And really is, I'd say, the first step toward the American Civil War, um, the way it lays out in the 19th century. And the reason this matters so much is that coming out of the American Revolution, I, I don't know if you guys have a chance to talk about this, I'm sure you've, you've touched on it, but coming out of the American Revolution, you know, there's an open question about the future of slavery in the United States. Uh, most of the prominent founders, you know, people like Thomas Jefferson, uh, hoped that slavery would eventually somehow, somehow, to use Lincoln's word again, disappear and die away, right? The founders recognized the contradictions between what they fought for in the, re in the revolution in independence and liberty and freedom and the rights of man, and then to continue holding people enslaved, and that didn't seem to fit very well together. And the, the founders were really, I, I would argue, embarrassed by slavery. And that's why it's, the word slavery doesn't show up in the constitution. There's three different parts where slavery is in there, but it, the word itself doesn't come in because they didn't want it. It hoped it would somehow again disappear long-term. Well, the Cotton Revolution makes that impossible because what happens with the Cotton Revolution is that cotton prices go up in the 18 teens and it makes slavery more valuable than it's ever been. And it puts the United States on a very different trajectory when it comes to slavery. And, and the reason that happens is, is really because of the, the prominence of the, the British empire, right? England's um, place in the 19th century world. So one of the things I always tell my students and something I would emphasize if I was teaching in eighth grade as well is that if you lived in the 19th century, you really lived in a British world. Um, the British Empire was by far the most powerful economic, political, and military force in the world. And the reason they were those things is because they had a massive trade empire. And their ships went everywhere and they traded in all kinds of goods and it brought amounts, huge amounts of wealth into the British, uh, into the British Empire. And the large percentage of that trade empire was built on textiles. 
So when you guys talk about the industrial revolution, right? What we're talking about is, you know, a revolution that really starts in England in places like Chess, um, Manchester and Preston, um, where you have these massive machines and you guys can see this, you know, image right here of these textile machines that are producing textiles that are sold all over the British world. And in the late 18th century and early 19th century, most of that had been built around wool. Where they would shear sheep, feed the wool through these machines, put out textiles and sell them. And that worked out really well, but the British started experimenting in the late 1700s and early 1800s with this new material, it wasn't really new, but it was new to this, um, called cotton. And, and the reason they were making the transition to cotton is that it seemed to have a number of advantages. It was lighter, it was more durable, um, you could print things on it, which made it uh, more fashionable. But you could also scale it up. There's only so many sheep that they could shear and feed the wool through these machines. So um, around 1815 or so, British industrialists they shifted pretty much their entire industry away from wool and toward cotton because you could grow tons of cotton and you could get an almost unlimited supply of cotton, at least in theory, that you could feed into these machines. When they did that, in 1815, this is at the close of the uh, War of 1812, but when they did this in 1815, massive demand for cotton was now coming out of the British Empire, and that drove the price of cotton way, way, way up, and it doubles overnight from 15 cents a pound to 30 cents a pound in 1815. Just think about that for a second. In 1815, the price of cotton, as of the British, doubles from 15 cents a pound to 30 cents a pound virtually overnight, and that then sets in motion one of the most consequential migrations in all of American history, right? So you can see in the map here, people start pouring down into the Mississippi River Valley, the places that will become Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, all those deep South places. People start pouring into those by the thousands, tens of thousands, and ultimately hundreds of thousands after 1815 in order to grow cotton because the, the Mississippi River Valley was a great place to grow cotton. It was really hot in Mississippi, which meant you had a lot of frost-free days. You had a lot of rich soils. Um, you had a lot of river systems, good for irrigation, but also for shipping. And probably most ideal of all, you had New Orleans at the mouth of the Mississippi River. It was an international port. It had been founded by the French in 1718. It connected you to world markets, and most importantly, it connected you to the British. And so People started pouring down to this region um, in massive numbers. About a third of a million people will move down into this territory between 1815 and 1820. That one. A third of a million people moved down here from 1815 to 1820 um, in order to build this factory in the field of a cotton plantation. Right? This was the ideal because this would make you rich, right? If you were able to clear some land and plant cotton and grow it, cultivate it, pick it, clean it, and then put it into these, compress it into these, these cotton bales. These guys see on this, um, on this wagon right here, these are 450 pound blocks of money, all right? This is, this is how big these cotton bales were, 450 pounds. And if you would put it on a steamship, I don't know if you can see in the background here, there's a steamship um, out on the river right here, which steamships had just been invented not long before this. You can load up that steamship with these cotton bales, and you can ship it down to New Orleans, and you can load a, the hull of a ship heading for Liverpool, England with cotton bales. You can literally make a boatload of money, right? Making, sending all this cotton off to the British. And so um, not only did people pour down to this region, but cotton production in the United States absolutely took off. The United States goes from producing virtually no cotton on the global scale in 1800, to by 1820, we surpassed India as the leading producer of cotton in the entire world. And we're producing 85% of all the cotton that the British Empire is importing, right? So it's a massive amount of money being brought down here. And it's a massive amount of money being generated here. And it is therefore making slavery more profitable than it has ever been. And this is one of those big shifts that happens, right? Because with the cotton revolution, now the economics of slavery have been reinvigorated in a powerful and long lasting way because the people who are coming down here recognize that as, as much land as you can get into cultivation, you can make that much more money, right? And so 
40% of all the people who come down here during this period are being brought down as enslaved servants, men, women, and children who are owned by somebody else, who are being brought to labor on the land and grow cotton and be the labor force that makes those fields so profitable. And by 1820, as early as 1820, every third person in Alabama was enslaved. Um, half, half of all Louisianans were enslaved by 1820. And, and the reason again is, is, is straightforward economics made it a very compelling model, right? Every enslaved person you could put to work on your plantation meant eight to 10 more acres in cultivation. Eight to 10 more acres means about eight to 10 more bales. If you do the math on that, especially at 30 cents a pound when prices are so high, basically if you invest in buying an enslaved person, you're gonna make more than your money back the first year. And then after that, that person's paid for themselves. It's just going to be profit on top of profit on top of profit, depending on how much land you can get, how many people you can have working there, right? And so slavery expands dramatically as the cotton revolution expands dramatically, all right? So when you have your teak standards like 812B here, which says explain the reasons for the spread of slavery, right? One of the things I recommend emphasizing is that this massive expansion of the economy under cotton is this reason that slavery also expands geographically during this time period in an incredibly rapid fashion, right? The speed with which this happens, I think is part of the story that I would recommend emphasizing with your students because all this happens so quickly. So look at the map right here, right? We got Northern territories and enslaved territories down here in the South. Mississippi and Alabama become states almost overnight. I mean, this cotton revolution begins in 1815 in earnest. Mississippi is a state two years later in 1817. Alabama follows two years after that in 1819. And this, this is where slavery is not just a part of the economic system, but now it's infusing itself ever more deeply into the political system in the United States. Because the United States during this period, one of the remarkable aspects of our political system is that power expands in the Congress with geographic expansion, right? If you bring in more territory and those places become states, every one of those new states gets at least three members of the, of the Congress, two senators and one member of the House of Representatives. And so when, when new states come in like Alabama and Mississippi, suddenly there's four new senators representing the South in the United States Congress. And slavery is now front and center in Southern, not just expansion in terms of economics, but expansion in terms of its political power as well. And this becomes very quickly a point of contention between these free states and this newly invigorated enslaved territory that seems to be moving South and West at a rapid clip, right? And so this comes to, I say blows, but uh, political fights over Missouri when Missouri, I think is how I'm supposed to say it, but when Missouri um, petitions to be joined to the United States as a slave state, right? And the petition is uh, admitted as a slave state. Oh, this sets off a giant fight. And the, we often, I know you guys talk about Missouri and what Thomas Jefferson called the fire bell in the night and this, this, this fight. We often talk about it in the context of like, and then Missouri and suddenly slavery is a big fight. But you gotta contextualize that within this cotton revolution, this massive expansion, because it's not just Missouri, it's that Alabama and Mississippi had preceded it. And there's this new rapid expansion. And it seems this expansion is not just going south and west, but it's also going north in a way that people hadn't really expected. I mean, if you look at Missouri here on the map, it's you know north to south is pretty much lined up with Illinois and Indiana, right? And it, a newly expanded, invigorated South is now expanding slavery into all kinds of new territories. And this sets off this, this um, battle within the US Congress about what's that gonna mean for political power in the country, right? The balance between free states and slave states in the US Congress, as people start, I say picking up battle lines, but North and South starts staring at each other more directly over these lines of power that are being drawn in the US um, Senate, right? Now, as you guys know, and I know you teach in, in your classes, Missouri gets admitted and is balanced out by Maine as a you know, two for two kind of thing when it comes to, to the Senate. And, and they try to solve this issue long term by drawing the 3630 Louisiana Compromise Line, right, to, uh, under which slavery can exist, which is basically modern day Oklahoma and, and Arkansas. 
north of which slavery will not exist, right? The rest of the Louisiana Purchase, this unorganized blue territory here, will be free forever and ever and ever, and things are going to be cut off. And so I want to point you guys again towards the Teak Standards 8.6b, when it asks you to analyze westward growth of the nation, including the Louisiana Purchase, I would emphasize you want to talk about that in context here with the expansion of slavery under cotton and these controversies with the Missouri Compromise as they're trying to figure out where they're going to go. And they chop up the rest of the Louisiana Purchase, you know, the northern portion being reserved for free states. And I want to emphasize this to you. Look at the map, right? That does not leave much more room for the expansion of the slave south. Just Arkansas territory, as it's labeled here. It's not very much compared to what the free states are going to get, right? That's a pretty broad imbalance there. Um, and so in some ways, it looks like the future of slavery's expansion is, is, is hemmed in by all of this. But the next big turn and pivot that I would emphasize to you guys, and if you're teaching eighth grade US history, I think will be a great pivot for your students who are coming out of seventh grade, is that there's a line drawn here with slavery can't expand west past. But slavery does continue to expand because cotton expands into Texas, despite these lines, right? So the Red River and the Sabine River obviously marks the international boundary between the United States um, and by 1821, a newly independent Mexico, right? That doesn't stop the expansion of, of cotton, right? The cotton revolution is bigger than the United States and it continues moving west. So when you think of Stephen F. Austin and you think of the Anglo colonists who go into Texas during the 1820s, that's the cotton markets moving west. And that is cotton um, from Mississippi and planting. All that goes into Mexico with Stephen F. Austin. That's, that's really what he's advertising when he goes there. Right, slavery goes with them, and slavery becomes a big issue in Texas um, during the 1820s and 1830s. And I'm keying you this mainly because your students will have just come out of seventh grade, and they, you know, uh, the Texas Revolution in the Republic of Texas gets the most time in almost all district scope and sequences, and so they'll have dealt with this in probably greater depth than almost anything else. The revolution and then the Republic of Texas that follows it. And the point you might want to key on to tie this into this U.S. history piece and have a, you know, a spiraling overlaps is that that cotton market moving into Texas is what leads to the Texas Revolution. And that's what leads to the Republic of Texas emerging as, as really a cotton empire. That's how it's conceived. Um, I did a whole book about some of these topics. One of the things I say in that book is I talk about Texas as the Republic is Pretty much everything the Confederacy is later going to try to create, a cotton nation that's also built, therefore, on slavery as, slavery as the labor system, that's what the Republic is. The reason this matters on the road to the Civil War for eighth grade U.S. history is because when Texas does all of that, the Republic fails, and Texas then is annexed to the United States. And that's what breaks through this barrier of slavery expanding west in the United States. It had been fairly well hemmed off the Missouri Compromise, but when Texas joins the United States, all right, that brings in a whole massive new territory and debates over slavery had been at the heart of whether Texas should be annexed to the United States. The reason that happens is because these American cotton farmers leave American boundaries and take that into Mexico. And then after Texas um, joins uh, the United States and Andy Graybill talked about this in great detail, I know it leads to the war with Mexico um, and go into all kinds of detail about that. But for the purposes of the road to the Civil War, the big outcome that comes from that, of course, is the Mexican Cession. Right? All that land between Texas and the California coast, 500,000 square miles of land that has been brought into the United States. And when it's brought in, it raises the same question that bringing in Alabama and Mississippi and then Missouri had brought in, which is, what happens to those territories? Are they going to be slave territory? They're going to be free territory? That's going to have a huge effect on the political balance within the United States, right? And so when you guys talk about that in your classrooms um, with you know readiness standard 8.6c here, for example, and it asks you to explain the causes of the US-Mexico war, which Dr. Graybull talked about, one of the effects and their impact on the United States as it's listed here, I want to emphasize to you is it forces the rest of the United States, Northerners and Southerners to decide, is this Western territory going to be slave territory or is it going to be free territory, right? 
And because the Cotton Revolution has reinvigorated the economics of slavery, it's also supercharged the politics of slavery, because now these things have real lasting and powerful impacts on how Northerners and Southerners are going to see their future tied to whatever happens to this territory out in the far West, right? Now, most people thought this was going to not be an immediate issue because people aren't probably moving out to Arizona and New Mexico in big numbers from the United States anytime soon after the Mexican session and the Mexican War. Um, but as you guys know, and I know you guys talk about in your classrooms, you know, gold is discovered in California in the late 1840s. It's the 49er gold rush. And then California, turns out people like gold. So enough people go out there in such a fashion that California has enough people to petition to become a state of the United States, which is a much better situation than being a territory. You can have your own state government and run your own affairs. So California... Uh, petitions to join the United States as a free state. And this forces both Northerners and Southerners all of a sudden in the immediate aftermath of the US-Mexico War to confront this issue of, okay, what is this gonna mean for the balance of power now between slave states and free states, particularly when it comes to the United States census, our census, um, the United States um, uh, Senate. So when we get to this point, Something I always do with my students and I, I highly recommend it is I pause and I try to talk through with my students, okay, why is that such a crisis? I, I start with Mississippi, Alabama and Missouri and talking about the balance there. And I say, now when this comes in again, you know, 20-ish, 30-ish um, years later, why is that such a big um, problem all over again, all right? And the way I do that is I talk about the Southern perspective and the Northerners perspective looking out West. And this is something that I, I spend a good deal of time with because I think it's important to unpack if they're gonna understand the road of the Civil War that lays out after that, right? So here we've got a Southern, this is my stand in Southern, all right? And say he's in Virginia, Georgia, Mississippi, or even Texas, all right? And he's looking West and he's looking at, you know, New Mexico, Utah Territory, you know, the areas that's going to be um, all, all that territory in the West. He is, he, he feels very strongly that slavery must be allowed to expand West out of that territory, right? Question is why? Why is this so important, all right? Well, for one thing, and I always explain this to my students, he sees the West as important, but also because it's going to have an effect on the East, right? So he's not as he's not solely concerned if slavery goes to New Mexico or Arizona. He's concerned that if it does or doesn't go there, that'll affect the Senate. And if that affects the Senate, then that will have an effect on where he lives. Because if Northerners get in charge and control, maybe they'll push to, to limit slavery's expansion, and that'll be bad for him. So in many ways, he sees what happens out in the West as a proxy for what's going to happen in the East. If something happens out in California or in New Mexico, that might have an effect on Virginia or Mississippi or Texas. And he's determined, no matter what happens, that he has to protect this investment in slavery because economically, he's very, very vested in this surviving, right? I started about this talk about the talking about the cotton revolution and the, the doubling of prices for cotton in, in 1815. And prices had gone up and done very well in the 20s. In the 30s, they go down because there's a panic. But right after the US-Mexico War, cotton prices start climbing again. This is real important again on the road to the Civil War because just like in the 18 teens, this invigorates the, the cotton economy and therefore it's slavery. So cotton prices start climbing to 20, 30 year highs during uh, the entire 1850s. And so the Southern investment in slavery doesn't go down. It's not that things are wilting and going away during the 1850s. They're, they're as vibrant and really doing better than they've ever during the 1850s. So much so that by 1860, by the time you get to uh, the eve of the Civil War, Southerners, white Southerners, have $3 billion invested in their slaves. $3 billion. That's in 1860 money, right? an enormous amount of money. So just from a livelihood standpoint, um, the Southerners feel very strongly that this is something that they have to defend. If they have to defend it in the West, protect it in the East, and vice versa, they're going to do that. By the time you get to 1850 as well, um, white Southerners have also come to the conclusion 
that slavery is a not just an economically good thing, but it is a morally, politically, socially good thing. It's just good all the way around, right? Where the founding fathers had been kind of embarrassed by slavery and saw it as something that's a backwards sort of thing. They just didn't know quite how to let go of and, and hope would go away at some point somehow. By the time you get to the 1850s, white Southerners would have told you the exact opposite. It's like, this is great. This is not just great for us because yes, it's making us money, but it's good for the enslaved people. It's good for everybody. And, and we're holding on to this thing. They called it a positive good. And, and how do we know this? This is, what I, this is the phrase I always use with my students. How do we know this? Because they said it. And they said it over and over and over again, all right? So I'll give you an example. This, this image right here is the front page of the Texas Almanac for, as you can see, 1858. Um, and it was, it's, it's still published to this day. It was full of all kinds of uh, amazing information. Um, but there's an article in this almanac where a, a white Southerner in Texas in 1858 explained why slavery was a good thing, right? And um, I'm not gonna read through these in the interest of time. They're gonna be in the PowerPoint that uh, we'll put up on the Google Classroom so you'll be able to read through these um, on your own. But the, the long and the short of it is, is it explained is that slavery is good according to white Southerners. It's good for the enslaved people. Um, it's, it's good for um, the white people who own them. And it's good for the economy, not just for the United States, but really for the entire world. And so all things depend on this, all right? And there's something else I wanna emphasize to you guys, and this is important to talk about on the road to the Civil War, is that because of the Cotton Revolution and because of the profitability of all of this, white Southerners went through this process of rationalizing slavery, right? Humans like to think of ourselves as very rational creatures, and occasionally we are. But my observation through history is that we are actually much better at rationalizing things. And white Southerners did that over the course of the 1820s and 30s and 40s. To by the time they get to the 1850s, they say, this is a good system for everybody, including African Americans. It's good for everybody. So my point in saying all of that is this white Southerner looks West and says, slavery must expand West because it's in my interest, but it's in everybody's interest. It's morally right, it's socially right, it's economically, it's politically, and always right. And therefore it is the future and we must take it there, all right? He believes that very strongly. So it becomes a zero sum game. On the other side, of course, are white Northerners who see this from a very different perspective. And this is something that I have a little more trouble, I think, walking through with my students. So I, I think it's an exercise that's worth having and walking through our students on the logic, such as it is, of why white Northerners oppose slavery expanding West, right? And I'll ask my students, like, so we understand why white Southerners thought this was good. Why do white Northerners think it's bad? And invariably I'll have, you know, several of my students throw their hands up immediately and say, yes, I know why. And I'll say, yes. And I'll say, because slavery's wrong. Of course, morally wrong. That's why they opposed it, which is our modern position and a very good one to hold. I definitely agree with that. But um, I have to explain to them is like, no, that's not how most white Northerners saw this, right? That's what abolitionists would have said, right? So this is William Lloyd Garrison. Well, I know you guys know who he is, but um, you know, abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison, I have to emphasize to my students time and again, were the minority by far of public opinion, even in the white North. Most white Northerners did not agree with William Lloyd Garrison that slavery should be banished just because it's morally wrong. Um, they, they were taking this usually from a much more self-interested position, right? So I try to dissuade my students from thinking the white North is full of abolitionists who are doing this for the, the moral righteousness of opposing slavery. If you ask most white Northerners, they would say slavery is wrong. And, and a lot of them would say it's morally wrong too. Abraham Lincoln said, if slavery is not wrong, nothing's wrong. Um, they would have also pointed much more directly to, you know, it's bad for the economy. It's not efficient. It's bad for our political system because the, the South here is abusing its power and all that sort of stuff. And the thing that would have resonated with the most white Northerners, they would say it's wrong because it's threatening to me. And so if you're a, a white Northerner and you're trying to raise yourself up in the world, if you're born a poor white Northerner, and most white Northerners were born poor, your way up in the world was to work for somebody else for a wage. Right? You'd work on somebody else's farm and save up your money if you were thrifty enough 
And if you saved enough money, eventually you could buy a farm. And if you could buy a farm, man, that's real economic independence because now nobody can tell you what to do. You grow your own food. Um, you, you answer really to nobody, right? And that's your way up towards prosperity in the world. It's an American dream, really, if you're a white northerner. What does that depend on, though? High white wages. So if you bring slavery into a region, that's going to depress white wages, and that's going to be an immediate threat to most white northerners. And so white northerners see the expansion of slavery as a direct economic threat to them and a broader threat to the political system as a result. And so they feel that slavery must not expand west, west for the exact opposite reasons of white southerners. And so set all that up. Right to, to point very strongly to, I think one of the most important teaks when you're talking about the road to the Civil War, 8.7c that asks us to analyze the impact of slavery on the different sections of the United States. This opposing vision of the West and what it's gonna mean for the East is so deeply at the heart of everything that happens throughout the 1850s. If students don't understand this, it's gonna be virtually impossible to understand why Northerners and Southerners end up at each other's throats. Um, during the period that, that follows from here. And this is different than saying that, you know, so much, uh, so many of my students at the college level will come in and say, well, the North were, you know, they had cities and they were urban dwellers and they, and the South was a bunch of farmers who had slavery and they're just totally opposite. So they didn't agree and say, no, not really. White Northerners were farmers, overwhelmingly farmers, right? So in that sense, the South and the North aren't that different. But they do oppose over the system of slavery for self-interested reasons on both sides. And understanding that distinction and why it creates a chasm, I think is at the very center of understanding why both sides get paranoid throughout the 1850s, staring at each other across the divide about what's going to happen here. California is the pivot because it forces Northerners and Southerners to start arguing with each other, an argument that they're not going to end until, well, really until 1865. So... <sighs> California petitioning to join as a free state produces these massive fights in the US uh, Congress, specifically in the Senate. And we have some of the great debates in the Senate. There's you know, Henry Clay in the middle there holding forth with John C. Calhoun lurking appropriately enough here on the left. Um, and they come up with a compromise of 1850 brokered with, by Henry Clay. We don't need to go through the details. I know you guys know the, the basic semantics of the compromise. I just wanna point out though, that this is the beginning of this effort, much like the Missouri Compromise before it, to, to find some middle ground on slavery. The problem is the whole 1850s is this long story of the middle ground eroding over the, over the issue of slavery, as both sides increasingly feel like they're getting a the short end of the stick and they're staring across the crevasse at, uh, or the, crevasse at the northerners or southerners, whoever their enemy was in the situation, who would be increasingly impossible to deal with. So, with the Compromise of 1850, California comes in as a free state. The rest of the territories are organized. It could be slave or free, just depends who shows up there. The idea of popular sovereignty, that's a win for the North. So the South gets the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 that forces Northerners to act as slave catchers for the South. Um, by the way, when we talk about states' rights, here's an, a good example of the South was very happy to use the federal government when it was in their interest and tramp all over the North's states' rights. There's a North in this case that's saying their states' rights were being trampled on by the slave, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And the White South is saying, y'all be quiet now. Uh, the federal government has power to deal with these sorts of things when it, when it needs to, all right? And then slavery is abolished in, well, slave, slave trade's abolished in Washington, D.C. Slavery itself continues. It's a compromise in the middle that really satisfied nobody. And, only sets up the next big controversy, which is the Kansas-Nebraska Act, right? You guys know this, in 1854, the territories that had been reserved by the Missouri Compromise to be free state territories, right, get uh, rezoned as anything goes territory. Nebraska and Kansas, whoever shows up first, thank you, Stephen Douglas, um, and his partner in South Carolina, Andrew Butler, will be free states, slave states, just, you know, whoever gets there first, that's how it's gonna go, right? And in the aftermath of Mississippi, Alabama, Missouri, California, all these controversies over these things, that meant the stakes were enormous because everybody understood that geographic expansion 
means political expansion of power in the United States by this point. And so this sets off a series of, of conflicts and chaos, right? So you guys know people start pouring into Kansas from both the North and the South to try to claim it. A, a civil war literally breaks out in Kansas between Northerners and Southerners, each trying to claim the territory. They have rival state governments at Lecompton and Topeka. They send separate rivaling constitutions. It's, it's a hot mess and it matters because they literally start killing each other. Right? Most famously, John Brown uh, makes a, a national name for himself when he and his sons go slaughter some pro-Southern settlers on Potawatomi Creek. And, and you know, the nation feels at, at, a, at, a, at the precipice of something really awful here. And it raises the emotional tensions here where both Northerners and Southerners are appalled at the actions of the other and start imagining the worst possible things about each other, right? I think the most important outcome and the one I would definitely emphasize with my students is Northerners are so outraged by this rezoning of the Northern half of Louisiana Purchase to go back to that peak that they found the Republican party or some Northerners um, in the aftermath of the Whig party dissolving and the Free Soil Party not becoming as big as it, as it wanted to be. Um, angry white Northerners established the Republican Party on this platform of, and this is the only thing the Republican Party stands for when it's founded in 1854, slavery must not expand West, done, right? So that Northern perspective of if slavery expand what spans West, it's a threat to, um, to white wages and really to, to white labor. Um, that's the, the very essence of the Republican Party. And that matters, obviously, for all kinds of reasons. But the central one, I think, to emphasize right now is that when the Republican Party emerges, this takes away the middle ground for compromising over slavery, right? Because when the Republicans show up, the one thing they can't compromise on is the one thing they stand for, slavery not expanding West. And so this takes away the ability to have something like the Compromise of 1850 or the Missouri Compromise before that. And, and so it becomes an increasingly all or nothing debate in, in the United States between free states and slave states about who's gonna win what, um, which makes the political contests therefore all the more um, charged and tense, right? So in 1856, just two years after the party was founded, um, the Republicans run in the a presidential candidate, uh, John C. Fremont for the presidency in 1856, and you can see here on the map, uh, the Republicans are in red, Democrats with James Buchanan are in blue. Obviously the Republicans don't win, but what's remarkable is how effective they're showing is. They win a large number of Northern states, they do really well. And they do the math and they realize pretty quickly that they could win every, if they win every Northern state, they could win the White House. That is possible to do because the North has a large enough population, so we have enough electoral votes in the North to make that possible, right? So the Republican Party walks out of this fairly charged saying, good job us, we can, we can actually do this. The South is alarmed by that, but the South is comforted by the fact that the Democratic Party, however, remains a national party. You can see here they won you know, Pennsylvania, which is where Buchanan was from, um, Indiana, Illinois. As long as they win at least one or two Northern states, the Democratic Party, which is still a national party, is going to continue to win. And therefore the South is gonna be at least safe when it comes to the White House, right? So both sides walk out encouraged and discouraged at the same time, right? In 1857, these tensions go up even higher with the Dred Scott decision. Um, you guys know the Dred Scott decision, so I'm not gonna litigate that myself. But the thing that comes out of that that I wanna emphasize for you guys is that this is again, part of this rising tensions as the ability to compromise immediately seems, or it continues to seem to dissolve between Northern and Southerners. Dred Scott had sued for his freedom. Um, the Supreme Court, um, heard this case, and then Roger Taney, the uh, Chief Justice, the 80-something-year-old Marylander, um, who wanted to deal with this problem of slavery and expansion West in this case. And he ruled, well, first thing he ruled, of course, is that Dred Scott was not a citizen of the United States because he was African-American and was not included in that. Then he goes on to rule, Justice Taney does, that um, the federal government had no right to prevent slavery's expansion West. Right? And so here the federal government can't prevent uh, the, the expansion of slavery out westward, which basically is, if you enforce that, invalidating the entire um, platform of the Republican Party, raising the stakes once again um, in the North, 
and angering Northerners, Southerners who cheer this decision as a good job, federal government. This is where the South is very much in favor of, of what the federal government is doing here by enforcing all this, right? The point is by the late 1850s, um, Northerners and Southerners have become so polarized and charged over this that they're staring at each other literally over this Mason-Dixon line, right? We have a geographic division, North and South, that, that creates these two different warring paths over the over political power in the United States. That's all tied, once again, to slavery and is being supercharged by the economic situation that Cotton has placed everybody within, right? That is this sort of like tinder box that is going to explode the Civil War. And, and the person who <laughs> lights one of the first matches is, is John Brown again, right? shows back up in 1859. When he does, um, he does so trying to start a slave revolt. He goes to Virginia, um, where he wants, it has the largest enslaved population at the time of the Civil War. And he wants to start a slave rebellion by taking over a federal arsenal, basically a warehouse for weaponry, handing out those weapons to slaves in Virginia and starting a slave revolt. So he attacks in October, October 16th, uh, 1859 succeeds briefly in taking over you know, the arsenal, um, but his, his rebellion does not happen. The US Marine Corps shows up, arrests him. Um, he's put on trial by Virginia, and then he's hung in early December, um, 1859. And that's the end of John Brown. But by this point, the South has become so paranoid um, about the North that they see all Northerners as variations of John Brown. And they feel so threatened that um, white Southerners demand that when the Democratic Party nominates a candidate for president in 1860, that they nominate somebody who will be vehemently in favor of slavery expanding West, right? So we talked about those Northern and Southern perspectives, those two little stand-ins we had for North and South. They're saying we need a presidential candidate who is, believes that Southern side, that slavery must expand West because they know the Republicans are gonna nominate someone who fully is invested in keeping slavery from expanding West. And this has become an all or nothing, zero sum political debate, right? And so the South, the Southern states tell the Democratic Party, you need to nominate somebody who's that strongly um, in favor of slavery expanding West. And the Democratic Party doesn't do that, of course. They instead try to find somebody who could appeal to Northerners and Southerners. And so they nominate Stephen A. Douglas uh, from Illinois, right? Who author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act and popular sovereignty, and he's not forcing slavery expanding West. He's all about whoever gets there first. So it's not good enough for the Deep South, particularly the Cotton South. And so those states, and you guys are mostly in Texas, um, Texas helps lead the walkout from the Democratic Convention that nominated Stephen Douglas. And they, they essentially go down the street, nominate their own candidate, John C. Breckinridge, a Kentuckian, who is fiercely in favor of making, uh, enforcing slavery's ability to expand West. And so the Democratic Party in 1860 has essentially split itself now sectionally between Northerners and Southerners, between a Northern Democratic candidate and a Southern Democratic candidate. When they did that, they opened the door to the Republicans to fulfill their dream that seemed fairly unlikely just a year before this. Because now, since the Democratic Party is divided between sections, that means if the Republicans can nominate somebody who can win every Northern state, they can possibly win the White House. Now, to do that, they're gonna need to nominate somebody who's, well, I mean, fairly boring, right? Somebody who is good enough for most people, but not so out there on anything that will offend much of anybody, right? You need someone just really in the middle, not an extremist on one end or the other of the Republican Party not even somebody who's been well-known or famous enough to you know, have a big enough name to really have strong, strong feelings in most, most, most voters. So that's how they end up selecting Abraham Lincoln because he is such a moderate and he's such a middle ground and, and really just such a boring candidate that he could be eh, good enough for most Northerners is the Republican strategy. Okay. So they nominate Abraham Lincoln in 1860 as Mr. Boring Pants, right? The guy who's just not gonna be very offensive, which is kind of how he looks to a lot of Northerners. Does Lincoln look boring to the South? Does he look like uh, a moderate kind of middle of the ground meh kind of candidate? No, he looks, he looks like a radical, right? This is a little known, um, little known portrait of, of Lincoln during one of his vacations in the summertime. I love the internet that you can just Google 
you know, Rebel Lincoln, and here you go. Um, actually, I put Punk Lincoln, I think, into Google to get this. But I, I bring it up, I use this, you know, to, to make a, a really serious point, which is that Lincoln looked like somebody who's way out there, a real threat um, to the South. And, and we know this because Southerners said it, right? And Southerners said it all the time. So this is a, a newspaper article from San Antonio right after the nomination of Abraham Lincoln. And I'm not gonna read it in the interest of time, but you can go back to the PowerPoint and take a look through here of how they describe Abraham Lincoln. They describe him as the ultimate extremist who's gonna burn down everything and destroy the South and ruin slavery. And it's all over if Lincoln's elected president of the United States, right? Because they've reached this paranoia level and they've rationalized themselves all along the way, their position of defending slavery at literally all costs. And now they feel backed into a corner. So when Lincoln is elected, November 1860, it's really their worst nightmare come true. Um, and so they move very quickly towards secession, right? So we get back to that, that role of how slavery somehow was at the heart of all of this. And the question of how these controversies played out over this time period, and what the Teats asks us to say, which is to explain that central role. It's a long winding path and it's very tied into all kinds of things, not just the economy again, but the political system especially and the social system as well. And emphasizing all of those pieces and how they fit together is how we can help our students understand that when you talk about states' rights or you talk about sectionalism, you're talking about slavery at the very center of that. And, and emphasizing that is the only way it's gonna make sense to them of how they got to the precipice of war, and therefore how we got into a war that will really redefine the United States forever. Um, with that, I'm going to stop and see if we have time for questions.